Okay, so let's uh, continue from where we left off last time. Remember last time we were talking about this notion of intermediate configuration and so on, and we introduced an energy density W <coughs> based on the in so-called intermediate state as reference. And we indicated this depends on the so-called elastic part of the deformation gradient, which we called H. And in most of the literature, H would be F sub E, or F, you know, F elastic. And we also have here K. We wrote H equals FK, so K would be the inverse of the usual plastic, plastic part of the deformation gradient. Here we're calling it that, the inverse of K, we're calling it capital G in this course. So unfortunately, there's a lot of notation going around and one just has to you know, familiarize yourself with the notation being used by the person in question. So, okay, so we have, um, we demonstrated last time that the strain energy function, WH, which encodes all the elastic properties of our material, um, satisfies the Legendre Hadamard condition just as this referential energy density, capital Psi does, this energy, capital Psi is the energy we had before per unit initial volume, in unit volume of the reference configuration. And let's see if we need a refresher on that. Yeah, here's the relationship. This is the capital Psi on the left is the, <clears throat> again, the strain energy per unit in reference volume. And using the determinant of G, this gives us an energy per unit, so-called intermediate volume, even though there's no volume per se associated with this intermediate state, because this intermediate state is really a vector space. It's a tangent space to our manifold, uh, a non-Euclidean manifold, as we'll see. But nevertheless, we, because G is well-defined and its determinant is also, we can make this definition and then this has that interpretation as an, of an energy referred to the intermediate state. So <clears throat> we deform the intermediate state elastically to get the current configuration at time t, and the energy WH is, is, uh, determines the stress required to do that in accordance with this we had last time. Uh, remember last time we were talking about the case in which we fix K, say there's no plastic evolution, fix K, K of X, some function of X, right, like so, then this just defines some function of F because H is FK, some function of X, F and X. So in effect, at fixed K, the material behaves just like a non-uniform elastic material a conventional non-uniform elastic material. From our earlier discussion about the symmetry of the Cauchy stress, we deduced that that strain energy function should be insensitive to rotations. Therefore, we deduced that W has the same property. W at H is the same as W at QH for any rotation Q. Therefore, it depends on H through the Lagrange strain formed from H, so this is the elastic strain because the Cauchy-Green deformation in its definition is based on the elastic part of the deformation gradient. <clears throat> and then just to, to refresh your memory, dWdH then is analogous to the Piola stress, but now using the, the intermediate state as reference. That's the deformation gradient to the current, which is now H times second piola Kirchhoff, which is this. And this second piola Kirchhoff is again based on the intermediate state as reference, right? <clears throat> so these are all quantities that are to define point-wise. So they pertain to this vector space, this tangent space to our manifold, which we're calling kappa sub i. <clears throat> And we can relate this to the Cauchy stress in the usual way. Remember, Piola is Cauchy times the cofactor of the relevant deformation gradient. That's H here. If we use WH for the Piola stress based on the intermediate state, 
then we need a cofactor of H here to relate to the Cauchy stress, okay? And so on. And then we proceeded from there, just to recap, to, to show that the legendre hadamar inequality is again satisfied here. <clears throat> well, I'd like to do what we did uh, way back on page 27 when we were talking about pure elasticity. I'd like to uh, interpret that legendre hadamar condition in terms of the strain energy expressed as a function of the elastic strain. And if you go back to page 27 and just simply redo the calculation verbatim, you'll get this second order tensor, the second derivative of W with respect to H, evaluated at H, operating on an arbitrary second order tensor A, is that second order tensor times S, which is our second peel of Kirchhoff stress, using the intermediate state as reference, plus H times the second derivative of U, operating on H transpose A. It's the exact same calculation, so I won't do it again. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> for example, if I put in, in place of H, if I put in a rotation, which is admissible because the only restriction on H is that it should have positive determinant, and the rotation certainly does. Put in H equals some Q rotation, we get this, where now E is now zero because of course, when H is a rotation, E is zero. H transpose H would then be the identity. And you and likewise here. So with E equals zero here in, in this second derivative, these would be the uh, elastic moduli computed on the basis of strain, derivatives with respect to strain. When E equals zero, I'll call that C, a, a kind of allographic C. And that's what this is supposed to be. This is a C with a kind of bar through it. That's the second derivative of the energy with respect to strain evaluated at zero strain. Those are the classical elastic moduli that you study in linear elasticity, okay? This, this tensor contains things like the Schur mod, if, or in the case of isotropy, the Schur modulus, the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio, that sort of thing. Okay, well, we, we stipulated in our discussion from last time that this intermediate state is stress-free. And we remember we went to some lengths to argue that you can always unload a body or an arbitrarily small piece of the body to zero stress if you remove the forces acting on that body. And so that's how we interpret our this intermediate state. Again, if you insist on observing this intermediate state in Euclidean space, it's just a cloud of dust, right? The dust particles essentially with zero size, essentially zero size. You can paste them together into a connected set in a non-Euclidean space, however, as we'll, we'll discuss. The point is, however, being stress-free, that means when there's no elastic strain, that is when, uh, when the elastic strain is zero, there's no stress either. So that means this object here, this stress at zero strain would, be, would disappear in this theory. And then we have the left-hand side boils down to this. We can now evaluate, so in this discussion here, we, all we've done is to rotate the stress-free state. In other words, we've taken H to be a rotation. We could look at the situation when we're actually in the original stress-free state but by putting Q equals to the identity or H equal to the identity, then we just get this. Q is the identity. So if we now impose the legendre hadamard inequality, which it purports to be true for all H, if we impose it for when H equals the identity, then we would get this statement. So these classical linearly ela linear elastic moduli, calligraphic C, would satisfy this inequality for any vectors A and M. Okay. <clears throat> and if you recall back in our early discussion, page 28 of these notes, we, we guarantee this once and for all 
by stipulating that this fourth order tensor should be positive definite on this linear space of symmetric tensors. Of course, C has this property of not only major symmetry that we talked about before, but also the minor symmetries. So this operation picks up only the symmetric part of what's inside the bracket, and also only the symmetric part of the prefactor here. Well, this, this prefactor and this postfactor are special cases of general second order tensors. So we can guarantee this once and for all by taking C to be positive definite, that is A dot C operating on A is strictly positive for all A with a non-zero symmetric part. If A were skew, then this left-hand side would be zero because of the minor symmetries of C. Okay, so just like an, an ordinary matrix, so think of C as a six by six symmetric matrix, right? Mm -hmm. Just as in an ordinary matrix, this means that C is positive definite. A positive definite tensor is invertible. And so this C can be inverted. Okay. Okay, so then we can have an estimate now for the actual stress associated with a small elastic strain. Remember we said at the beginning of the course and more recently that experiments indicate in, in, in real metals, the elastic strain is invariably quite small. Materials yield uh, at small elastic strain. So the, the, elastic, the elastic part of the strain is invariably small. So we could use, exploit that smallness to get an estimate of the second Piola-Kirchhoff stress just by Taylor expanding this function about E equals zero. Okay. So the lead term would be the stress du dE at zero strain, which we stipulated is zero now. The, the next term would be the second derivative of the energy at zero strain operating on the strain, the difference between E and zero would just be E itself. These are these classical elastic moduli I've just indicated, fourth order tensor, plus high order terms, small o over the norm of E. So if you, so if you take a derivative, or sorry, so, so at leading order, S would just be C operating on E, and then if the strain is small in magnitude, then this would be uh, the accurate leading order approximation for small strain. We've indicated a moment ago that C is invertible. So we can invert this relationship to get E as a linear function of S, that is fourth order tensor operating on the second order tensor S. L is simply the inverse of C. So if you regard C as a six by six symmetric matrix, you invert that to get L. These are the elastic compliances. So we'll call, we'll call C the moduli and L compliances. So I'm just sort of inventing notation here for want of uh, any more sort of more standard notation. Uh, having, ex having secured an estimate of the stress in terms of strain, we can do the same for the energy, expand the energy about e equals zero using a Taylor expansion. The lead term disappears, it would be E minus zero, in other words, E inner product du U D E at zero, which is the stress at zero strain, which is zero. And then the next term would be quadratic, one half E inner product with fourth order tensor at zero strain operating on E plus high order terms. So this, this here is our classical moduli, calligraphic C. And in this expression, I can suppress u at zero because that's just a constant. When I differentiate it to get the stress, it, it, it disappears. So typically people simply neglect any constant that appears in the strain, ener in the strain energy because it has no, it, it's, it's physically unmeasurable. What we measure in experiments is stress, forces, and so on. We don't measure energy directly. So without any loss of generality, we can simply suppress u at zero because it plays no role in the mechanics, differentiating that energy 
you would zero would be ir irrelevant. Okay, so <clears throat> so that's that that'll be our the, the manner in which we compute stress, at least second pillar curve, curve stress, based on the intermediate state as reference. We'll use this constitutive equation, where C will reflect the properties of the material as it in its intermediate state, so-called stress-free state. Well, um, if you think, for example, of a cubic crystal, so this is our intermediate state, we deform it by H to the current configuration of the body. We embed it in the current configuration this, by using the, the elastic deformation. <clears throat> um, it, it, normally, you remove stress from the crystal, it, it'll assume it's perfect crystal and lattice structure. Okay. So if you, if you would say take some salt crystal, cubic crystal, and shear it, it would be distorted, a distorted cube. But if you remove that shear, it will simply be a perfect cube, cubic lattice. So this, will, this would be associated with what we called earlier when we we're talking about pure elasticity, an undistorted state of the material. In an undistorted state, the symmetry group of the material, if you recall, is a subset of the set of rotations, orth plus, proper orthogonal tensors. Right, that's what we meant. So, so if you remember our characterization of solids some time ago, beginning of the course, we defined solids essentially following Knoll's idea. A solid is a material for which there exists an undistorted state, a state relative to which, or configuration relative to which, the symmetry group consists of rotations. It's a subset of the set of all rotations. So here, we would interpret this intermediate state as an undistorted state associated with zero stress. Zero stress in a crystal normally means the crystal will assume it's the kind of structure that you would look up in, a, say, a book on crystallography, right? If you look up a book on crystallography, they'll tell you, well, salt is a cubic crystal, for example, or iron is a cubic crystal. What they mean is when the lattice is unstressed, the lattice of the crystal is unstressed, it assumes the shape of a cube, for example, or some other crystalline shape. So we can attach this notion of undistorted state, which is part of the definition of a solid a long time ago in the course. Uh, the undistorted, we, the, the intermediate state we can take to be precisely such an undistorted state. That's important because relative to this kappa i then, the symmetry group consists of rotations, not every rotation, say, just in this case, the rotations that will map a cube back to itself, and here's an example of the rotation R that maps a cube back to itself. When you do that, you take the this intermediate state and map it to a new intermediate state, and then deform that new one by H times R to get the current configuration. That's essentially the content of this equation here. Okay, so that discussion about undistorted states was on, looks like it was on page 19 of these notes. <clears throat> Part of the definition of the solid the, is the assumption that there exists a local reference state, local configuration relative to which the symmetry group is contained in the set of rotations. Okay, so that, that applies here in this context. <clears throat> So that means we can say an awful lot about the moduli and the constitutive equations relative to this state, the elastic response, in other words. So the strain energy here, written as a function of the elastic strain, well, this says we have invariance of the strain energy under this rotation belonging to whatever crystalline symmetry group that we have. I like to use a cube because it's easy to illustrate. <coughs> And it's also probably the most relevant symmetry group for metals, right? I think copper is uh, cubic and iron is cubic and so on. Of course, there are other like hexagonal crystals and so on. But certainly 
cubic crystals are among the most relevant for us. So this st statement says, if you replace H, the elastic deformation by HR, where R is a, rot a rotation belonging to the symmetry group, then you don't change the response. Let's see what that implies for the strain energy written as a function of elastic strain. Replace it. So here's the definition of elastic strain. Replace H by HR. That means you do this, R transpose H transpose HR. Notice that because R is a rotation, I can factor it out in front and in back. I can write the identity here as R transpose identity R because R is a rotation. And then if I sneak the one half back inside the parenthesis, I just have R transpose ER. So this is equivalent for, because, because we have invariance of W when H is replaced by QH, this superposed rigid motion invariance, then the strain energy expressed as a function of strain satisfies this symmetry condition. Notice now that whereas we stipulated R could, must be a rotation here in this statement, if I replace R by minus R, this equation is still satisfied. If R is a rotation, then minus R certainly is not a rotation. This is determinant then is negative. So this extent, effectively extends the symmetry group from a subset of the proper orthogonal group to a subset of the full orthogonal group. R, R can be any orthogonal, it can be an orthogonal tensor right, characterizing the symmetry of the crystal. I think there was a question about that way back uh, when we were talking about pure elasticity, if, if R must be a rotation. Ultimately, we see here that it does not have to be a rotation. It simply has to characterize some symmetry. So for example, as I just mentioned, if, if you have an element of the symmetry group, a rotation, so if, if, if that uh, satisfies the symmetry condition, then minus R, which is orthogonal, also satisfies the same equation. Physically, you can see what that means. So for example, suppose you have a crystal which has a, a plane, crystallographic plane in it, which is a plane of mirror symmetry in the crystal, which is the typical case. And let's say N is normal to that plane. Then here's a, a rotation to N tensor product N minus the identity. You can show to yourselves that that's actually corresponds to a 180 degree rotation about the normal N. So suppose our crystal is such that that R belongs to the symmetry group. Then as I've just indicated, minus R does too, but minus R is just this, this thing here. And that's a reflection through this, through this plane. So in this way, we effectively, this condition here on the previous page, <clears throat> extends the notion of material symmetry to allow reflection symmetries, to accommodate reflection symmetries in the symmetry group. A, a reflection, however, mm -hmm. a reflection cannot be achieved by deforming the lattice, right? A, an actual different deformation, just like if you look in the mirror, your mirror image cannot be achieved by deforming you in some way, right? So uh, in effect, we, we accommodate mirror type symmetries or the kinds of geometric symmetries that cannot be associated with uh, rotations. Okay, so there's a slight enlargement then of the symmetry group by virtue of this invariance under superposed rigid motions. <clears throat> okay, let's see uh, what this material symmetry condition implies for the stress. So recall that the stress was the derivative of the energy with respect to elastic strain. <coughs> if you like, you can, call, you can think of U as the elastic strain energy. Right? It's the only kind of strain energy we'll talk about. Let's look at a one parameter family of strain. U is the parameter, let's say. And suppose U is defined in some interval, 
which includes zero. So let's say when the parameter is zero, that's E sub zero, you get E sub zero. And the derivative of V with respect to the parameter, we we'll call it E dot, evaluated at zero, we'll give it a name, it's some symmetric tensor, A. This could be any symmetric tensor, it doesn't have to be positive definite or anything because E itself is not. And this one parameter family of strains, then if we put that in the strain energy function, we'll get a function f of u, right? And we can take its derivative. By the chain rule, that would be the derivative of u with respect to e evaluated at e of u, inner product e dot with respect to u. This thing, this derivative is just the stress, the second pillar Kirchhoff stress, the constitutive function for it, evaluated at e of u and then inner product e dot. We can evaluate that at u equals zero, and we get s at e zero, inner product a, e dot is a at e equals zero. So let's keep that in mind, that's equation one. <clears throat> the symmetry condition we just talked about, I called it equation star on the previous page, tells us that the same f of u is equal to this, because u at e is the same as u at r transpose e. E R. R is a fixed element of the symmetry group. And it's only E that depends on the parameter. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we can take a derivative of this now. That will be the derivative of U with respect to this entire argument. <coughs> that would be the stress evaluated the same argument inner product, the dot of this argument. R is fixed, so we just get R transpose E dot R. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is factor out the E dot on the right. To do that, and so that this, this operation looks like this. You've got three tensors on the right of the dot product, and you've got one tensor on the left, so it looks like this. If I, if I use the trace definition of the dot product for tensors, that's G, the trace of G times the transpose of this product on the right. So that would be D transpose, C transpose, B transpose. Now, if you remember the properties of the trace, you can simply commute the product without affecting the trace. So I can put the B transpose in front and I get the same trace. Now, that's the same as B transpose, D, D, D transpose, inner product, C. You see, here's a C transpose in the trace that brings out a dot C. So I apply that to my case here and I get, let's see, B is R transpose, so the transpose of that would be R. Then I get this G in front, which is S, evaluated this argument. Uh, D here is R, so I get an R transpose in back and then dot E dot. Evaluate now at zero, u equals zero, I get r s hat r transpose e naught r r transpose dot a. <clears throat> so I get two ways of writing f dot at zero, and of course they must be equal to each other because the same left hand sides are the same. So I could subtract equation one from equation two, and I get this square bracket inner product a equals zero for all symmetric a. Inside the bracket is a symmetric tensor, right? S is symmetric, R, R symmetric, R transpose is symmetric. So I get the inner product of this, a symmetric tensor with every other symmetric tensor is zero. The only way that can happen is if the bracket is itself zero. And then I get this relationship. If I multiply through by R transpose, or R inverse is the same as R transpose because R is orthogonal, then that, that gives you this. So this indicates then how the, st how the stress is affected by what the condition that must be satisfied by the constitutive equation for the stress, where whenever R is an element of the symmetry group for the crystal. This, the simplest classical example is isotropy. In fact, in, in your next homework, I think I'll ask you to discuss uh, cubic crystals in this framework. The simplest classical example is isotropy where everybody knows the stress-strain relation. 
The stress is a function of strain is lambda, lambda moduli lambda mu, trace of the strain identity plus two mu times the strain. Replace E by R transpose ER. For isotropy, R can be any orthogonal tensor, if you recall, right? So we get lambda trace, just replace E by R transpose ER, you get this and this. <clears throat> in the trace, I can permute the factors. I can put the R in front, do that here. This is the identity because R is orthogonal, so I get the trace of E back again. I can write the identity itself as R transpose identity R, and then factor out an R transpose in front times this times R in the back. So I get this, which is an example of this general, this general relationship on top. This now is good for any rotation R, right? So for isotropy, this is an example of the use of this result. So we will, we will, need, we will need this general result later on. <clears throat> Okay, I've been promising you for a long time now that we would connect these notions of differential geometry to the idea of dislocation. So let's revisit the, the, the notion of dislocation, which we briefly introduced, I think, last time. Remember, we introduced this Berger's vector uh, associated with a, a curve. Let's say, let's say you have a surface in the reference configuration, and that surface is bounded by a curve ds. Last time I called this ds, I called it gamma. So we can associate then with that surface a Berger's vector, the integral of g dx, the plastic part of the deformation gradient, integrated around this closed curve. <clears throat> Last time that was just our definition of Berger's vector. Well g is the inverse of this k tensor we've introduced. We wrote h equals fk, right? which can also be written as F equals HG, where G is K inverse. And now we can invoke Stokes' theorem. If you remember if, uh, some lectures ago, we talked about Stokes' theorem applied to tensors. The integral of a tensor over this, the boundary of a surface is the same as the surface integral of the curl of the transpose of that tensor operating on the normal to the surface integrated over the surface area. So we have curl K inverse transpose. This presumes that K inverse is a continuous function. I misspelled continuous here. Uh, we will generalize this later to allow discontinuities in the K field. But for now, let's look at the simplest case when K is continuous. We also showed that the same Berger's vector can be computed this way on the basis of the inverse of the elastic deformation integrated over the image of this curve in the current configuration, we'll call it d small s, h inverse operating on d small x. By Stokes' theorem again, that can, that can be written as the spatial curl. By, by the way, here, this is the referential curl, the curl based on the curl is computed from, a, from gra a gradient, and the gradient is with respect to reference position in this capital C curl. In this lowercase c curl, that's based on the gradient with respect to position x in the current configuration. And this is h inverse, and this is a transpose here outside the parenthesis. Then small n is the normal to this surface in the current configuration, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> So the idea here is that small s is the image of capital S under the deformation, the overall deformation chi. So capital S is a material surface, and so is small s is the image of that material surface in the current configuration. So we see then that curl k inverse, or capital curl k inverse, or small curl h inverse, furnish measures of the Berger's vector per unit area. We'll call those alpha r for capital curl k inverse, r associated with the reference configuration, alpha t for the configuration at sign t, small curl h inverse. So these, these, will, these are called the referential and spatial 
this location densities. If we know those and we know the surface, the orientation of the surface, that we're integrating over, then knowledge of these would, would provide us with the Burgers vectors, Burgers vector associated with that surface. So these are densities of dislocation, area densities of dislocation. <clears throat> By the way, if, um, if you try to take the curl of F, the deformation gradient, because F is itself a gradient, its curl will be identically zero. So your, your K inverse, remember, is, is capital G. If G were a gradient, there'd be no dislocation density and hence no dislocation. So the way you get dislocation is by admitting that G or H inverse are not gradients, okay? Just as we have stipulated before, okay? Um, you'll notice that alpha R depends intimately on operations taking place in the reference configuration. And so its definition depends on how we choose the reference configuration. Let's see if we can come up with a measure of dislocation density that is completely insensitive to our arbitrary, you know, it's sort of idiosyncratic choice of reference configuration, which is after all something we choose, the material, uh, the material doesn't, you know, have any knowledge of or, or concern about the manner in, in which we choose a reference configuration for our own convenience. So let's see if we can come up with a measure of dislocation density that's insensitive to our choice of reference. Okay, so again, our choice of reference is arbitrary in principle, subject only to the requirement that it should be in one-to-one -one correspondence with points of the material, right? So let's imagine changing the reference configuration, say from reference kappa R1 to another one, kappa R2. The way you do that is by mapping one reference configuration to another. We've talked about that before when we're talking about elasticity, the notion of changing reference configurations. So suppose, po suppose points, positions in kappa R1 are called X1. X1 is a variable that ranges over kappa R1. We'll map that to position in kappa R2, we'll call it X2, okay? And we'll suppose it's a, a differentiable invertible map, just like any other deformation. So we can introduce its gradient, grad lambda. I'll put a subscript one to indicate that's the gradient with respect to position X1, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so remember that G d cap X is the same as H inverse d small x, right? You can, you can verify that by writing d small x as F d cap X, and H inverse F is just our G, okay? But if we change the reference configuration, the H and the small x are not affected by that. We're just transforming the reference configuration. We're not touching the intermediate, configuration or the current configuration, okay? So that means if we change the reference configuration and use say X cap X1 as position, then we would use a G1, which is the same as the inverse of K1. And that would be the same as K2 inverse of DX2, right? Because this, this left-hand side would be the same because it's given by this. This is insensitive to a change of reference configuration. So the left-hand side had also better be insensitive to the change of reference configuration. So writing K inverse equals G, we just get this equality for the two reference configurations. We also have that DX2 is the gradient of this lambda with respect to X1 times DX1. That gradient was the R that we talked about. This R now, don't get confused, this is not an element of the symmetry group. It's just defined to be the gradient of this map. There's no symmetry discussion here. <laughs> it's just a, you know, <clears throat> I've either run out of notation or I can't remember the alphabet very well. So I'm using R, I'm overusing the letter R. <clears throat> 
So put that in here, I get K inverse, K1 inverse DX1 is K2 inverse R DX1. This purports to be true for all DX1. So K1 inverse is the same as K2 inverse R. Invert that and you just get K2 is RK1. So here's a diagram to go with that discussion. Here's our current configuration. Here's our intermediate state associated with our material point P. No, nothing happening to the, to the right of this, my, my cursor here is being changed when we change the reference. It's just, when we change the reference, it's K that changes in the manner we just described, right? <clears throat> So let's use let's look at using these two ways of calculating the dislocate the Burgers vector. If we use configure reference configuration kappa two kappa r two, we'd integrate over a surface S two using I'll call it curl sub two, which is a curl based on position capital X two. The relevant k k two inverse all transpose n two, which is the normal to a surface here. In configuration kappa R2, DA2, that's by Stokes theorem, that's this, integrated over the boundary. I can use this to make a change of variable. The DX1, which is integrated over the surface DS1, <clears throat> that's simply this. And use Stokes theorem again, and I have this. S2 is the image of S1 under this change of reference I called lambda. <coughs> and I can, I can also relate N2 DA2 using Nansen's formula, the Piola Nansen formula. Remember, NDA goes like cofactor of the gradient, which is R in this case, times the original NDA. And I can use this then to convert the integral over S2 to an integral over S1, just to change a variable. On the left, I get this curl two, K2 inverse all transpose, cofactor R N1 DA1 equals the right-hand side here. The change of variable now means I'm integrating over S1. So now that's good news because now I have everything under one, under, under one domain, S1. <clears throat> And that surface S1 that I've chosen in reference configuration kappa R1 is an arbitrary surface. So, since the surface is arbitrary, I can localize to get equality of the integrands, but the arbitrariness of the surface means also that it, the normal N1 is also arbitrary. So I get the integrands are equal for all unit vectors N1, arbitrary unit vectors N1. I could take the N1s to be aligned with the elements of an orthonormal basis to conclude that the prefactors are the same also. So we get this equality, curl two, K2 inverse all transpose, R star cofactor is curl one, K1 inverse all transpose. Of course, R star is the determinant, J sub R, I'm using that notation, J sub A to mean det A, where A is any second order tensor. J sub R, R inverse transpose. Um, let's multiply through by R transpose to get this to the other side and then take the transpose of the whole result. I'll get this. Remember, R is K2, K1 inverse, so JR is the determinant of K times the inverse, the reciprocal of the determinant of K1, right? So if I use this result with this, I just get this equality. So this combination, JK, K inverse, curl K, is the same for any two choices of reference configuration. So that combination is insensitive to the choice of reference configuration. So that suggests that we define this new tensor, I'll call it alpha without any subscript, 
JK, K inverse, curl, referential curl, K inverse. This is a measure of dislocation density that is totally insensitive to the choice of reference configuration. Okay. So it's, in, it's intrinsic to the material. It's an intrinsic property of the current state of the material. And for that reason, we'll call it the true dislocation density. It doesn't depend on our artificial choice of reference configuration. Well, we can do the same thing using the H inverse definition of, remember, the alpha sub T. We can do the same story by working in, with a change of current configuration, let's say, current configuration kappa T1 with position small x1. I can map it to another deformed configuration kappa T2 with position x2 in the same way. And I will conclude that this, in exactly the same way where this is now a spatial curl, is insensitive to the current configuration, the deformed configuration. And in fact, <clears throat> what's remarkable is that this will be the same alpha that we had up here. So that this combination is exactly the same as this combination. Okay. <clears throat> the reason it's the same alpha is because the two ways of computing the Burgers vector, capital B and small b, are the same. They're the same Burgers vector. So if you're interested, uh, I would encourage you to fill in the steps here to prove this assertion. So this, this alpha we've introduced, which can be written in either of these two forms, either in terms of K inverse, which is the, simply the plastic deformation G, or the inverse of the elastic, with of course different curls. This is referential, this is spatial. <clears throat> that alpha has a really remarkable feature, which is, is it's, it, it retains its value no matter what reference configuration you choose, and no matter what the deformation of the material is. Okay? In other words, no matter what current configuration it occupies. So, in fact, from this discussion, it's automatically insensitive to superposed rigid body motions because all a superposed rigid body motion does is take your current configuration, say x1, to a new configuration x2. The map here would be, you know, given by the rigid body motion, right? It, in this case, the mu of x1 would be q of t x1 plus some vector function of t. That would be a rigid motion. That being a, sp a very special case of this kind of map, it means that this alpha is completely insensitive to superposed rigid body motions. So we st we've stumbled on a kinematic variable, this alpha, which is automatically frame invariant. It's insensitive to rotation, super superposed rotations. It's, it's more than that. It's insensitive to anything you would do to the body apart from evolving the plastic deformation. Right? That property is shared by E, by the way, the elastic strain. Okay, both these properties, that insensitivity to the choice of reference configuration because the definition of E has nothing to do with the choice of a global reference configuration. And it's insensitive also to superposed rigid body motions. So it's, these, are, these are the kinds of variables that we look for when we set up constitutive equations that satisfy these invariance requirements. Let's go back and do some differential geometry. And what, what I want to do is show you that this, this location density we've introduced, the so-called true dislocation density, is a disguised version of the torsion tensor associated with this geometry. Okay, induced by plastic deformation. So uh, I think in some pre in page 61, yes, we've done this before. We wrote G, the plastic part of the deformation gradient, in this way, where the, these vectors small m that we introduced, which were just capital G operating on this G, the basis G sub i, right? So using that definition, we can just reconstruct capital G in this way, just like or the usual deformation gradient, except we have small m here instead of small g. And that's the inverse of our k, 
we can use these again to define a metric associated. So, so these vectors live in our intermediate configuration, these, which is a vector space, right? So we can use them to form a, a metric, I'll call it small m i j, and the connection, I think we discussed this before, the associated connection we in, denoted with a superscript hat to distinguish it from the other connections associated with the current configuration or the reference configuration. And the torsion, which is the skew part of this gamma with respect to the subscripts, is in general non-zero. We had that discussion. What I'd like to do is show you that that torsion is none other than the dislocation density. <coughs> um, so our m i comma j, just the usual way of decomposing any set of vectors, project them into the dual basis multiplied by the original basis, and we get this as before. Let's see, we, we talked before about the index lowered version of the gamma symbols. I think, uh, Zach, you mentioned that these are the, the connection coefficients of the second kind, right? And that's right. So sometimes these, with the index upstairs, are called the first kind connection coefficients. These are the second kind, but who knows or, and who really cares what we call them. It's just the index lowered version in the usual way, the way we've done before. And then if we repeat the discussion we had on page 39 when we were talking, introducing differential geometry, go back to page 39 of the notes. Remember we made this combination and we, this combination turned out to be, to ultimately determine the connection in the case of a symmetric connection, but we don't have one this time. If we simply repeat exactly verbatim what we did on page 39, except with this new metric and associated connection we've just introduced, make this combination of the partial derivatives with respect to the convected coordinates of this metric, we'll get this. So we have a minus here, kj minus jk. That's a skew, symmetri skew symmetrization in the second pair of indices. Then we have plus a ki minus ik, that's another skew symmetrization. And then a, a plus kij plus this time kji. Now, last time when we were lo looking at Euclidean space, these canceled each other out because we had symmetry with respect to the second, the, the, the second and third subscripts, remember, because of the symmetry here. So these canceled out. And we just got this. And then we raised the index back and we were able to solve for the gammas in terms of these derivatives of the metric. Now it's not so simple because if we reinsert the definition of these index lowered gammas in terms of the metric, we have this, right? And this is this line. The second pair gives you this line. And then the last pair gives you the plus. So we have a skew symmetrization taking place here, that's torsion. Skew symmetrization here in the subscripts, another torsion. And then we have a symmetric part. Okay, we'll see what we can do with that. So continuing on this page, the skew part of, of this gamma is one half this difference. So this difference is two times the skew part, right, in Kj. That's two times metric times torsion. Then I have the same thing again with different indices, two times metric times torsion. And then I have two times metric times symmetric part because the symmetric part is one half of this sum. So put the one half on the other side. And remember that the skew part is what we call the torsion with the indices shown. And then I carry the symmetric part of the connection here in the subscripts. Okay, so now we need a little more notation. <clears throat> Previously, when we were dealing with Euclidean space or even actually Riemannian space where there's no torsion, the, this, this object here was the connection, the so-called Levi-Civita connection, just 
the left hand side with the indices raised by the dual metric. In the older literature, you'll find this notation, this curly bracket, superscript M subscripts I and J to go with superscript M, K gets summed out and you get subscripts I and J. Now this is completely symmetric in the subscripts because here we have, for example, MKIJ, this is the same as MKJI. So this is symmetric in the subscripts and so is, so is this. So we'll resurrect a kind of old fashioned notation, which is this curly bracket notation, which in fact, people invented for this purpose prior to the use of the gamma mm -hmm. notation. So since we need a not another notation, let's resurrect it. These are called the Christoffel symbols, or as we've indicated before, the levi civita connection. And it's this part, this, this is based only on, the, this is determined entirely by the metric and its partial derivatives. Okay, so let's raise the indices on this second line here. Doing so gives you a, this curly bracket, levi civita connection on the left. And then, I'm raising the indices again here, as indicated, on all this stuff, right? So I'll just, I'll just keep this with the torsion tensors appearing here in these two terms. And then raising the index here with M super MK will give me gamma hat super, uh, let's see, I'll get a Kronecker delta LM M, M, L rather, M upstairs, L downstairs, sum on L, I get this. Okay, this looks like a mess, right? What we do is we remember that we can always write our connection, decompose it as a symmetric part and a skew part. M is playing a passive role, so just as this the usual symmetric skew decomposition of any second order tensor with two subscripts. M is just along for the ride, playing a passive role. Right, this is an identity. <clears throat> gamma Mij is the same as a half, gamma Mij plus gamma Mji plus a half, gamma Mij minus gamma Mji. It's just an identity. So this is our torsion. This we get by solving this equation. And ultimately then we get the full gamma connection is this. So here's our connection in the presence of torsion. So torsion, so the, 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 this, is, this is symmetric, but this is not the symmetric part because this here is symmetric in I and J. But th this is the skew part right here that comes from this over here. Okay, so we have this ultimate formula for the connection symbols in this geometry with torsion. <coughs> so if there is no torsion, everything disappears except for these curly bracket symbols, okay? And this is exactly then reduces to the levi civita connection that we had in our discussion of Euclidean space or even Riemannian space, starting on page 40. So uh, be careful though, just because we have the same form of connection that we'd have in Euclidean space does not mean that space is Euclidean. Because these curly bracket Levi Civita coefficients are computed from the metric based on these vectors M. But the M's are not the derivatives of any position field, if you remember, right? Precisely because the plastic part of the deformation is not a gradient. So in fact, these connection coefficients do not generate a Euclidean space. They generate what we call a Riemannian space, which is a, a 3D, we have a 3D Riemannian space. Riemannian space being a geometry in which we have a metric, symmetric metric, mm -hmm. and a connection, and that's it. That's the definition of Riemannian space. In, in two dimensions, that would give you the, Differential geometry of curved surfaces. In four dimensions, it gives you the theory of gravitation. <laughs>
these, so these are spaces with zero torsion, typically. The, the full case that we're, we're considering here. So for example, if you just looked at a connection with like this, so you just took the connection to be this by definition without reference to any vectors or any such thing as we did. You just took the connection to be this, you would generate what is in general a non-zero Riemann curvature tensor, okay? A, a space with a connection like this, where you have torsion and curvature together is simply called an affine geometry. And the, the gamma hats are called an affine connection. And the reason is these, these differential equations here that hold on, a, on curves depend linearly on the coordinate differentials, which are the, we wrote these before as theta dot j, where the dot was with respect to a parameter on the curve. So in general, then in a Riemann ge geometry, this equation is not integrable. So just before the beginning of the hour here, I mentioned a book by Stoker, where you can find exactly that discussion. You still have this, but this is not integrable to give you an MI field, vector MI field, in the whole space, okay? So there's a whole geometry based just on this kind of thing, and that's what we've just described. <clears throat> okay, so after all that digression into geometry, we would like a physical interpretation of this torsion business. Metric we more or less have a good feel for. It's basically it, it tells you st straining in the body, right? Um, metric, we, we, we understand. Torsion is, requires some clarification. Let's go back to our true dislocation density, alpha, and figure out how to compute this curl part. Let's you recall the definition of the curl of the tensor back when we discussed Stokes' theorem and so on. The curl of a tensor is itself a second order tensor, which when operating on any fixed vector C is the usual, is the vector curl, the curl of the vector A transpose C, is the definition of curl of the tensor. So that's any fixed vector C. <clears throat> Here we want the curl of K inverse, that's the capital G, and we previously wrote that in this way, small mi, f sub i, tensor product, capital G super i, the dual basis induced by the convected coordinates in the reference configuration. Operate this on, on our six, on our C and you get, so I take the transpose of this, it puts the capital G's in front and the small M's in the back, I get, operate on C, I get M dot C, M I dot C, which I'll call C I, with the capital G I left over, right? So the transpose again, you just interchange the factors in the tensor product and then operate on C. Okay. <clears throat> uh, if you look back on page 43 of the notes, see if I were actually with you in a classroom, I'd have to scramble through my notes and find, find this, but here we're so lucky to be on Zoom, you can just look up the relevant page. We had a formula for this curl involving a permutation tensor. This is a referential curl. So we use the referential permutation tensor, remember epsilon bar. It involves a covariant derivative. Remember the referential covariant derivative, I mentioned we would use the notation of vertical stroke instead of semicolon. That's defined here in terms of the partial derivative and then the referential connection coefficients and then the referential natural basis. <clears throat> The sum on i and j here, which is required in this notation, because they're, I, they're repeated diagonally, this is skew in I and, I and j, whereas this connection, remember this is a Euclidean connection, it's symmetric in I and j. So when I sum on I and j, this gamma part will disappear and I'll just get the skew symmetrized partial derivatives, the g left over, okay? <clears throat> So the important thing here is these are not the gamma hats, they're the gamma bars, which are Euclidean. So their skew parts are zero. 
And the reason is we're using the referential curl. <coughs> so just play with this a bit. Uh, C up here is constant vector, fixed vector C dot mi. Take it, so Cj would be C dot mj, take a comma i of that, be mj comma i dot C, and C has no derivative because it's a fixed vector. Then do the skew symmetrization in J and I, right? And now this parenthesis, I recognize this as a tensor product with capital G, whole thing operating on vector C. So if I go back to the definition at the top, compare the left-hand side with the right-hand side, <clears throat> invoke the arbitrariness of C, then curl K inverse has to be this. <clears throat> M skew j comma i is the same as gamma hat skew j i, which is my torsion, and then I have ml here. So that's torsion sub j i. And this thing, I remember I divide by the square root of the determinant of the reference metric, capital G, and then this is the conventional permutation symbol, one zero or minus one. Now in the definition of alpha, I had a JK. Remember when we had JF, the determinant of F, that was root small g over cap g, where the, the reference space was the reference configuration, the target space was the current configuration. For K, the reference space is the intermediate configuration, and the target space is the, is the reference configuration. So that's reference cap g, intermediate, M, okay? M is that Mij, of course. So if I put that all together now in the definition, and, the, and then I need to multiply, so I need to multiply this by JK to get alpha, but I also need to multiply by K inverse, which converts this capital GK to a small MK right here. What's left over then? I have this representation, alpha, the tensor alpha, the second order tensor, cope contravariant components given in this way. Here's the torsion, ML sits over here, permutation, doing this to it, I get a new permutation tensor, which is the permutation symbol divided by root small m. <clears throat> so that's a permutation tensor associated with this intermediate state. Okay, so the dislocation density is determined entirely by the torsion and, of course, the metric associated with the intermediate state. <clears throat> I can invert this relationship. Let's see that. Multiply it through by mu sub mnk, the, all, the fully covariant permutation tensor associated with the intermediate state. Then I get this. I have a diagonal sum on k here going on. <clears throat> I can use the E delta identity, right? Because the, the mu's with the downstairs have a root m here, which cancels the root m from the upstairs components. And then I just get permutation symbols and the standard E delta identity can be applied. We've done this before. <clears throat> Sum, carry out the sums on i and j and you get torsion nm minus torsion mn, but this minus mn is the same as plus nm, so I get this two times the torsion super L sub nm. So what I've done is to invert this relationship to compute the torsion in terms of the dislocation density, contravariant components refer to this basis, and the per associated permutation tensor. So effectively, the torsion tensor is, is the same thing as the dislocation density. We could you, when you talk, for example, about skew tensors, we talk about their dual vectors, right? So-called dual vectors, the vector associated with the skew tensor. Think of this as the dual tensor, alpha is the dual tensor of the third order dislocation density. And, and they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. 
in exactly the same way as a skew tensor is in one-to-one -one correspondence with its associated axial vector. So torsion and dislocation density are effectively the same thing. And so that means if you have plastic deformation, and hence you have dislocation, and, and hence dislocation density, you automatically have torsion. You have a geometry, the associated geometry is a space with torsion. So this observation uh, motivated people uh, in the, say, second half of the last century to undertake you know, a conversion of continuum mechanics to differential geometry. After all, kinematics and conventional you know, continuum mechanics is just an application of differential geometry. And an observation like this that we've just made you know, motivated people studying plasticity and defects in crystals, plastricity and in inelastic effects, to, to study the more generalized geometry in, in, that entails spaces with torsion. Okay, so there's an interesting history, quite a large literature, and it's fairly active to the present day. <clears throat> Um, before we leave differential geometry, I want to discuss the, the, the fact that the elastic strain is incompatible. Unlike the total strain, the actual strain in the material that takes you from the reference to the current configuration, that's compatible because the Riemann tensors associated with the current and reference configurations are zero. That's the, the compatibility conditions. So we say that the, the total strain is compatible. The elastic part of the strain, however, is not compatible. That is to say, there's no displacement field associated with it. And the reason is this torsion tensor business gets in the way. The torsion tensor, which is unavoidable in the general plastic deformation, acts in such a way as to render the elastic strain incompatible. And, and that's very important because it means that it, uh, you must have an, uh, an elastic strain field uh, to go with the torsion induced by plasticity. Having an elastic strain field means you have a stress field so that in a general plastically deformed body, you simply cannot eliminate the stress in the body itself. So this goes back to our earlier discussion of the presence of defects in the body, meaning you can't unload the body to zero stress everywhere. And ultimately, this discussion we're about to undertake, actually next time, uh, is a demonstration of explicitly of why that is. So I think we should end here because uh, the discussion will take a good 20 minutes or so. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, we can take them now. Otherwise, and we'll see you in office hours or on Thursday. Okay. And um, Professor, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, is the nomenclature for tensor and um, for rotation tensor, does it have uh, torsion tensor? Does it have anything to do with screw dislocations? Why do we screw, 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 screw dislocations are a very special case. Yeah. So, so you can arrange the dislocation den density it's a, it's a second order tensor we've just indicated, right? Yeah. A matrix of coefficients. Yeah. And different elements of that matrix correspond to different types of dislocation, edge or screw type. Yeah. yeah. So for example, usually the, the third, the, uh, the components with a second set, with a second index equal to three, yeah. One, three and two, three are screw dislocations, that kind of thing. And the other entries are associated with edge dislocations. So this really, they're all embodied in this single dislocation density. We didn't say which type of dislocation we were talking about. It's just a general Berger's vector, right? Okay. So it so assumes all of those different types of dislocations. Yeah. Into one I'm, I'm just wondering whether this insinuates that torsion means we have uh, torsional stresses in the body or something like that? Yeah, so I, I, I didn't have time today, but I indicated now that 
for reasons of compatibility. Yeah. Uh, because the, the, the current configuration of the body resides in Euclidean space, the associated Riemann tensor is zero. That'll put a constraint on the elastic strain and the torsion together. Okay. So the elastic strain, there's no way for the elastic strain to be zero everywhere in the body because the, okay. the torsion will prevent it from being zero. Okay. So because you have an elastic strain distribution, you will have a stress distribution whenever okay. there's dislocation in the body. Yeah, okay. we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, I'll stop the recording here.